right, people. I just got booted out of the house. My wife is uh, already bored with my YouTube channel. And uh, should I move this? I think I should move this a little bit. Yeah, so I'm in the van. This is probably where I'm gonna be relegated from here on out doing all my YouTube films. But it is a good trial run for later in this summer. I've got some plans to try to get on the road in the van uh, slash motorcycle, which is a bit of foreshadowing there. Uh, what have I been doing today? I got up at about six o'clock. I'm reading this book about the atomic bomb, the history of the atomic bomb. The book won the Pulitzer and the National Book Award and everything else. It is so dense and it makes you feel like a total dumbass because when it comes to quantum mechanics and theoretical physics, I'm always reminded that I got a D in college algebra, a D, and it was a mercy grade. The guy did not want to see me back and I did not want to see him ever again. And we kind of came to this unspoken simpatico, I'm gonna pass you, but I'm gonna give you the lowest grade possible. Also, this was during a time when this class was eight o'clock in the morning, three days a week in a basement room with no windows and the instructor smoked cigars in the room the entire time. This was called hell, hell on earth, D in college algebra. So this book about the atomic bomb and the science behind it, yeah, made me feel like a dumbass, but that's okay because it's not a uncommon feeling for me. What else have I been doing? So I've been doing a little bit of this, a little bit of this. It's a bit too hot in here for my beanie, but uh, doing this, this hasn't officially been released yet, second issue, but we're working on it. The actual slip, cover, slip covers are a bit back ordered. So we're waiting. And so when people want to fulfill those, we can give them a slip case, which everybody loves. I've been journaling a little bit and this we're going to get to in a minute for a little bit more foreshadowing because People sent in some wonderful questions. I really appreciate the people who are taking time to send in. For those of you who are wondering where to send them in, you can send them anywhere. You can email them to me, You can, which you can find on my shifter.media site. I have an email there. You can send them on YouTube, it doesn't matter. And remember, you're not limited to any category. My life is a, is a lot more, I guess, diverse, if you will, than just photography and bookmaking, although those are two things that occupy a lot of my time. And uh, I've got good questions. Just know also that if I don't get to your question today, it's because I have at least two more of these locked and loaded for after I'm done with this one, which I can't even remember what number this is. It could be 19, it could be 20, I don't know. And I am in between tasks and I've got limited time. So we're gonna bang this baby out. Question number one, this is interesting. David, I told you I would get to this question. Do you think that there's anything to the idea that by switching hands and holding a square format camera causes some extra brain work such that you are more focused, mindful, attentive to things like composition because your brain is working backwards? So I, when he asked me that, I was like, that's a very interesting question, but this, it immediately made me think back to my time. And this is a weird story. When I was a little kid, my father was a competitive shooter, as in mostly shotguns and pistols. And he would travel around and he would do this. And I had been shooting shotguns since I was a little kid. So it wasn't exactly a new concept to me. And if you start something when you're very small and you do it for a long time, odds are you're going to be pretty decent at it. And that was the case with me with shotguns. So I had a, the ability, I was approached by someone who I think at the time was part of the U.S. Olympic team who saw me uh, shooting when I was a little kid and approached my father and said, hey, if he, when he's old enough, if he can qualify academically to get into this certain school, then we will try to slot him into the team. And so I was like, okay. And the first thing that this guy did was took me out on the range and, and watched me shoot. And he said, you know something, you're, you're right-handed, but you're left eye dominant. And so he would tape over my right lens in my glasses. And so it was basically blocking my right eye. And when you shoot shotguns, you're shooting with both eyes open anyway. But I was like, oh, I'm right-handed, left eye dominant. So when I use a camera, I'm using my left eye all the time, even with a Leica, which is kind of slow and it's bungle, a little bit bungling. The people who can shoot right, Leicas with their right eye, I always felt that was a huge advantage because you could keep your left eye open and you could watch what's happening in front of you while your right eye is like dissecting through the viewfinder. But so I'm right-handed, left eye dominant, and I'm holding both well, kind of. No, I mean, the Leica's primarily being held in my right hand, the Hasselblad primarily in the left. I think it's just more to do with aspect ratio. It's more to do with 6.6 six as opposed to 35. When you hold a 6.6 six in your hand, whether it's left-handed or right-handed, what I the beauty of the 6.6 six is the elimination of vertical or horizontal. You just have one thing. 
it's just a square. And that is a relief, a, a wild relief that you don't have to think about that when you're in the field. I had a famous photojournalist look at a body of my work once and he said, you shoot more verticals, this was a 35, you shoot more verticals than anyone I know. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. That was the only thing he said about my work. He didn't say, nice job or great photo. He just looked at this whole thing and looked at me across a dinner table and said, you shoot more verticals. That's not a good sign. That's not a, what you call a ringing endorsement. That was obligatory response for in some way, shape or form. So David, it's a good question. I don't know the neuroscience behind that, but I do think the best photographers are people who are more than photographers, who are right brain, left brain people. Michael Clark, for example, here in Santa Fe, who's a photographer, I think was a physicist at the lab in Los Alamos prior to becoming a photographer. That's interesting to me. Here's a guy who is now firmly entrenched in the capability of being both right brain and left brain. I am certainly, I do not have that level of acumen when it comes to using that science analytical math side of my brain. In fact, I don't think I even have that side of my brain. That side, like, that side went away with Captain Morgan Rum when I was in college. I think I remember the exact moment with a bottle of Captain Morgan rum that was like this big that somehow we ended up with. By the time that was gone, my analytical brain was also gone with it. Question number two, and by the way, that first question, that's the kind of questions I love that, that are not, you know, they're a little bit beyond the, the stereotypical, you know, what lens do you use kind of thing. Question number two, this is from Billy. Hi, Dan, it seems like many people in life, but you can focus on photography books slash et cetera like labels, but few people like to be labeled. Do you have any thoughts, observations, or life experiences to share in this? I told you how good these questions are. Labels, it's a great topic because one of the things, and I hear this all the time, I hear filmmakers and photographers talking about, telling photographers that you have to find your niche and you have to drill down on that niche. That is both a really good piece of advice and a death sentence because once you drill down and you are labeled, you are in that, you're in a funnel that photo editors and art buyers and everyone else wants to immediately put you in. And I, what I noticed when, when the internet came along and digital technology came along, editors no longer had like one job or assignment in front of them. They had 10 and they were like all of us, they were suddenly juggling all of these things. And oftentimes what I saw were editors that wanted to be able to look at a photographer or see a name and immediately identify them for the genre or the niche that they were specific in. Oh, that's the guy that does X, Y, and Z. That's the woman who shoots, you know, product in LA, um, high key product, you know, four by five in LA. That's what she does. But here's the problem with that. I don't want to be labeled and I don't want to be a niche. And I, the further I get away from photography, the more I think that is a huge mistake. On the flip side, being a jack of all trades is also not good because now you're just a commodity that can sort of do anything for anyone. And those folks seem to be really be hurting right now. So it's a fine line, but I'll give you an example. One of the best automotive photographers I ever met in my life, and I, I only met him once or twice, and I don't know him very well, and this is, was a long time ago, but he showed me something, and it was seared into my brain to this day. And when I say automotive photographer, I'm not talking about a guy who gets a car on loan from a brand who drives around with a drone and maybe bangs something out on YouTube, right? There's a lot of folks doing that. What I'm talking about are people who were full-time automotive photographers. So they would have studios in Detroit, studios in California. They would have classic cars from all the different brands. So when the executives showed up at LAX, if they worked for Dodge, they would pick them up in a Dodge. If they worked for Pontiac, they'd pick them up in a Pontiac. If a Chevy, Land Rover, you know, Jaguar, whatever, they had fleets of people, they had fleets of vehicles. They were doing the advertising campaigns for the brands. These were people billing seven figures a year and they were few and far between, but incredible photographers, both knowledgeable in how to work with clients and also how to just comp how to pull off all this photography, traveling all over the world, you know, Morocco shooting Land Rover or whatever. One of these guys pulled me aside one day and, uh, you know, incredibly successful dude. And he, we we're in his office, just he and I, and he goes, do you want to know who I really am? And he takes a, a key, legitimately a key, and goes and unlocks a drawer in his desk. So the, the, the drawer is locked all the time. He opens up this body, this, this drawer, and there is a completely different body of work, unrelated to automobile. 
And he said, that's who I really am, but I can't show anyone. Because if I show anyone, it could confuse the people that know me as X niche, as auto guy, and I can't risk that. And that happened over and over again, especially when I would assist for people and I would realize that they were one person to the industry, but inside they could, they could be a totally different kind of photographer. So committing to a niche like that and being labeled, you know, if people ask me, I say I shoot long form documentary work but that's kind of nebulous and that might elicit a second question. Uh, but I don't want to be labeled. You know, I'm not, people still identify me as a professional photographer. And I tell people I'm not, I haven't been in 11 years. I have not been a professional photographer. I work for blurb, but there's still this like sort of misguided notion that photography is this romantic industry and that it sounds a lot cooler to say he's a photographer than it is to say he works for blurb. Me, I look and go, I'm the luckiest guy on the face of the earth. I've had almost 11 years at this company. It's been the best job I've ever had. I'll never have another job like this. I don't even think that a job like this exists anywhere else. So yeah, the label may not be as sexy, but I'll take it, baby. Question number three, for the next Q&A, aside from the revenue stream, why do so many photographers spend so much time teaching photography and marketing their courses? I know it's a source of income and maybe they don't make enough from their actual photo work, but do you think there is some other motivation? It just seems so odd that someone would choose to make a course instead of getting out and shooting. Um, that's from Paul. Paul, it's a, it's a good observation that there are, there are different flavors of photographers. So you've had photographers through history that are educators. And for example, there's an organization called Society of Photographic Education, which I've mentioned on this channel before. SPE, they have an annual event. Pre-COVID, they had annual events anyway, in person. It's one of the best photography events I've ever been to. Now, I grew up and spent my entire career on the commercial side of photography, not on the academic side. When I got to the academic side through SPE organizations going there for Blurb, I was blown away by what I saw. I saw people doing books and exhibitions and public art and museum shows and gallery shows. And these academics, even though they weren't, a lot of these folks are not well known in the commercial space, they had what every commercial photographer wanted, which was they had book deals and museum shows and gallery shows and public art installations. And I was like, whoa, what is happening here? These are full-time academics. They've devoted themselves to not only doing their own projects like that, but teaching the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So those folks, would I, I would call long play embedded education, you know, RISD, Savannah College of Art, ICP, Parsons, School of Visual Arts, Pasadena Art Center. Those are the kind of institutions where people are teaching. But what you're mentioning, and I think is what you're referring to, is about 15 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, you started to see a whole lot of workshop programs show up and they were being taught by people that a few short years prior would have never taught. They would have been embarrassed to teach or would have felt that it was below them or beneath them because they were, who knows, photojournalists or documentary people. And the problem for them is that the industry started to change. The industry started to shrink. The internet was not super kind to photography. Social media has not been kind to photography. And when you put your eggs in those baskets and they begin to erode the foundation of your industry, you gotta look for alternative revenue streams. So suddenly there were workshop programs all over the place. Now, in the middle of those two worlds, you have long running educational platforms in America, for example, you have Santa Fe Photographic Workshops and you have Main Media. These are workshop programs that have been in existence for 30 years, 40 years. They're teaching motion, they're teaching stills, analog, digital, every conceivable kind of course, and they do it really well. I took workshops in Santa Fe and and the first one I took was in 1997. It changed my career. I took another one in like 99. That changed my career. I took a workshop from a guy who's not teaching anymore and the first thing he said to me after looking at a project, he said, I'm really jealous of you. And I thought he was joking. And he said, you've done more personal work in the last year than I've done in the last 10. And at the time I was working for Kodak and I wasn't having to do any kind of assignments outside of what projects I wanted to do. So anytime I picked up a camera during the four and a half years I worked at Kodak, I only worked on my own projects. And after those four and a half years, I had a whole stable of projects that I had completed. And he saw those and said, man, you know, that's what everybody wants to do, but we can't because we're too busy doing assignments. That workshop changed my career. So you have people who are new to teaching out of desperation or financial re reasons. You have the workshop programs that have been really 
you know, helping photographers, both consumer, prosumer, and, and pros forever. And then you have the academic side. So they all teach for different reasons. And, um, you know, I'm teaching in September in Albania, uh, if all goes as planned. And that to me is a relief. It's, it's, a, it's a personal reason that I love, you know, I went two years ago, I tested out what I wanted to, to do, and that system seemed to, to interest people. And it gave me a chance to say, okay, well, I can, I can come back and I can help other people do this. This is not some giant financial windfall. I, I have no other teaching workshop plans other than online stuff. Uh, I'm teaching an online workshop for Santa Fe Workshops May 25th and 27th. Uh, I give talks and lectures all the time online, but that's kind of the extent of my, my teaching because I have a full-time job and I have AG23. And those two things suck up pretty much all of my time. But that's my two cents on that. I'm sure there are outliers that I didn't cover, but question number four. In summary, thanks. Someone listened to my, my dear photographer film and said, thank you. Well, I thank you right back. Two questions, a possible future Q&A. Do you know of any other online source, video, blog, podcast that has a similar outlook like you on photography? Uh, and have you heard of the photobillofrights.com and what are your thoughts on it? Uh, I'm going to answer the first question first, logically. As far as other channels or podcasts or writing uh, that, that are like mine, I don't really know. I'm sure there are. Two names I've heard consistently. People reach out to me and they go, have you seen so-and-so and so-and-so? First one, Sean Tucker. I don't, I, I don't know because I haven't seen his channel. And the second one is Alex Soth, who's a Magnum photographer who is way more distinguished than me, is also a really good publisher. He has a publishing arm called uh, Little Brown Mushroom. I've heard that he has a channel now and people have written me and said, hey, there's a bunch of parallels here. Uh, he Obviously, he is way beyond me in terms of photography, career, industry, p books, everything, in pretty much every conceivable way. I might smoke him on a bicycle for all I know, but he could probably beat me in every other, every other realm. But I haven't seen either of those channels. And it's not because I don't want to watch other people's photography channels. It's that I am so slammed. I mean, I'm in a van right now in between phone calls trying to bang out a YouTube film, right? This is not some long, in-depth, thought-out thing. I react because my calendar is so jammed with stuff and my afternoon gets even worse. So the last YouTube film I watched was how to replace the headlight on a Yamaha TW200 with an LED headlight, and I don't even own the motorcycle yet. So that was kind of a, a, a anticipatory viewing. It was probably a two and a half minute film, and I looked at it and I was like, I think I can actually do that, because I probably will replace the headlight on the Yamaha. It's apparently a terrible headlight and you want something brighter. I will probably do that. So that's my YouTube stuff is going in that direction, or fly fishing, or canoeing, or hiking, or cycling. Very, very rarely am I engaging back in the photography space only because I did it for so long. And my life, when I quit photography in 2010, I got my life back in a lot of ways. I got the life back that I had prior to being a photographer, which was much more well-rounded. You know, for 28 years or whatever, all I did was look at the world like this. That's all I did and all I thought about. And... So I, those two people are worth checking out, and I'm sure that there are others that I'm not thinking about because I can't think anymore, and my brain is like tapioca pudding most of the time. Photo Bill of Rights, I have heard of that, but I don't remember the exact details. You know, if, it has, if, it, if it's what I think it is, in theory, it's like a red light in the city of Palermo when you're driving. It's a suggestion that you might stop. Not a hard, there's no hard line in the sand. And if you've ever driven in Palermo or ridden with a Sicilian driver, you will know. Not necessary to stop those red lights. Just a hint, a suggestion. You may want to look both ways and slow down. Photo Bill of Rights, I should have looked it up. I didn't, and I'm guessing what it is. The, the problem is there's a real world out there, and no one cares about the Photo Bill of Rights. Uh, especially when it comes to law enforcement figures. I know law enforcement right now is taking a lot of heat for a lot of reasons, some of which is completely and utterly justified. That's my phone. Hang on, let's see who it is. It, 20 bucks is my mom. No. Nope. Nope, this is somebody who's calling about a podcast. Sorry, man. You're, if you watch this, I just hung up on you. But I'm in the middle. My mom's going to call me like 20 times today too, so I'll just go ahead and put my phone over there. The problem is that no one reads the Bill of Rights 
and you can put it in front of someone and they just say, I don't care. It could be a security guard, could be someone on private property, could be law enforcement. They will make up the rules as they go to suit their needs at that moment. So if you think you can pull something out that will justify your existence as a photographer at that time, you are in for a rude awakening. I have been punched, kicked, clubbed, gassed, and almost shot in the head with a rubber bullet. I've been detained against my will. I've been taken out in the desert and booted out of a van as, a, as basically an FU for doing a project on the border. Um, it happens. And I don't necessarily hold a grudge against any of these people. Some of the like punching and clubbing and stuff, that was, they did that because it was fun for them. And um, I didn't get hurt you know, too bad, but you know, it's out there. The photo bill of rights is kind of a nice thing depending on how you present it to people. Now, if you're a credentialed press photographer, that to me goes a lot further. Because when you have a credential from a big news organization, it's harder for people to say, no, you can't do that or you can't be here, whatever. Although those rules are all shifting. The last four years and what's happening right now politically in America is really scary. And um, I would not, it does not bode well for photography in public places moving forward. And if I am completely wrong about photo bill of rights, let me know because I potentially am. Question number five, what is a good place to start educating myself on what good photography is? Uh, I love getting photo books and analyzing them. The thing is I want to understand what really good photography looks like. This is a question that we've been skirting around and answering now for quite some time. And there is no one definition of what good photography is. And I mentioned this last week or the week before, I've made plenty of portraits of children that I was doing for commercial purposes that the parents looked at and said, this is the best photograph we've ever had of our, of our child. And I looked at it and said, doesn't work for me as a photograph. So for them, great. For me, not so good. Them, good. Dan bad. And so it was really hard to like put a label on that. I do think, however, that there are ingredients that do make good photography. And I'm just going to narrow this down to documentary photography because that is what I like to do the most. That is what I've done the most of. And I, of all the things I've done with the camera, that's probably what I am most skilled at. Uh, maybe the portraiture thing, I don't know, but let's just stick with doc stuff. A, a fundamental understanding of light timing and composition. Those things to me are critical. When, when a photographer who's been around for a while, especially shooting in the industry, getting published, working with editors, working with this stuff, you start to understand they are people that are helping you hone what a good workable file is, what a good image is. A lot of what I see now is being, being, being promoted, and actually I, I would say the majority of the work that gets the most amount of buzz in photography is really not good photography. What it is, is good buzz. It's people who understand how to create buzz, and they don't, know under, they don't understand how to make great photography. In fact, I had a conversation yesterday with another photographer here in town, and we talked about this, about how you know good photography is often not a part of conversation in commercial work now. It's about metrics. And so it kind of has, you know, it sucks a little bit of the soul out of there. But also good photography is very difficult and it's very rare and it's very time consuming and expensive, which is why you don't see that much of it anymore because timelines and budgets are short. And when you, when you, when you go from an 18 month timeline to six countries in 18 days, you're not going to get the same kind of work. So, you know, back in the day, you might get an assignment, not me, but people who were better than me. You know, take a, take a magazine, famous magazine. They might assign people for months at a time to go work on projects. Those days are gone. People are really being assigned for multiple days, multiple countries in the same time. It's shifted. So good photography is what you respond to emotionally. If it invokes an emotion in you, chances are it's good. And you, you have to ignore whether the next guy down the road says that I think that picture sucks. If, if you have an emotional reaction to it, then I think it's good. How do you, uh, and buying books is a really good idea. You know, documentary, to, to get a book published through a traditional publisher is incredibly difficult and incredibly expensive. You know, it's a 12 to 18 month publishing cycle. You're talking tens of thousands of dollars. You got an acquisitions editor, a designer, uh, the publisher above them. You, you know, you're working in tandem. People don't do things willy nilly when they're spending that kind of time and money. And so often when I look, I just, Steidl in Germany just sent me Gilles Perez's new book, which I'm gonna do a review on. And thank you, whoever and however that happened, I don't know if they saw my, my, my film on books I love on Telex Iran. Someone saw that and clearly either told Jill Perez or told Steidel or both. And in the mail a couple of days ago, my wife goes, did you order a book from Steidel in Germany? And I said, no. 
and I open it up and it's Jill Perez's new book. And by the way, when I do the review of this book, not only is the book amazing, but there is a, there's an insert of supplement that, ki that came with the book that is mind blowing that I'm going to go into in detail because I wish every photographer who did a book could get something like this. It is so important and so revealing as to the process, but books are a great way to understand that. Uh, next question is how do you know this is part of five or you know, maybe this is six. How do we know when we encounter good photography outside of the big names? Yeah, it's really just a, an emotional reaction. I, I can't tell you, hey, I just made this picture and it's good and you have to like it. I guess it's about refinement and understanding the basics of what make a good photograph and also having a really wide knowledge of what's already been done. You know, I, it just is like nails on a chalkboard to me when I see a young photographer promoting something as original and, you, and, I, and all I see in my head are the people who have done it before. And it's like, so-and-so did this in 98, so-and-so in 99, so-and-so in 2003, so-and-so in 2007, and they did a hell of a lot better job than what I see now. But that person now just ignored the fact that anybody else had done this. So it's about context, knowledge of the history, all of those things play in. But I have no right to tell you this is good and you have to like it, or this is bad and you can't like it. That just doesn't work that way. Okay, um, that is all a meandering five, six. I'm gonna do a 6.5. All of this might seem to be photography 101. Is this even a question? Is Rachel Kinsley, no, no, no. I think, that, I think I answered those. Question number seven. What is a fine art photographer? This is a good question. I'm gonna stop this just cause I can. Hang on, hold the phone, Chuck. Call Starkist. What time is it? What time is it? 10 okay, I still got a little time. We got two more questions. What is a fine art photographer? Okay, so fine art is a word in the consumer space, prosumer space, online space that's thrown around all the time, right? I'm a fine art landscape photographer. I'm a fine art, whatever. I shoot animals. I do still lifes. I'm fine art. But there's different realms of fine art. And this ties to the actual art world outside of photography. The art world are the parents in the room. Art photography historically has been one of the siblings and, or even maybe an uncle that did something wrong and maybe, did, maybe, maybe spent some time in the pen, right? He's a little bit dangerous. You don't really want him at the, at the family reunion pic, picnic because he might pound a 12-er and do something crazy. That's what photography was to the art world forever. It was this sort of kind of associated thing, but it never really got the respect. The art world was up here. The art world tends to have far more money, far more high level collectors. They're better organized that, you know, they know the art game, but all of a sudden somebody comes along and sells a photograph for a million dollars, right? Might've been Gursky, might've been Anders Gursky. And all of a sudden the art world goes, oh, wait a minute. Now we need to pay a little bit more relevance. We need to pay a little bit more attention to this art photography thing. So the, the art photography world revolves around galleries, museums, collectors, collections, public art, conceptual work. You have documentary photographers who have made that jump. You have photojournalists who have made that jump but very few and far between. Reality-based photography tends to not do very well in that art space. Conceptual photography tends to do well. But these are the people who are working, a, a, in my mind, a legitimate fine art photographer, gallery representation, museum collections, has a collector base, publishes books, could be an academic, could teach at one of the major art schools. That is what I would call the legitimate fine art. That is a community, it is an industry, in, into itself, of itself, inside the overall umbrella of photography. What I love about art photography, and I never liked this, I never appreciated it the whole time I was coming up in photography. I kind of, I kind of, you know, bagged on art photography because I thought a lot of what I saw were people who just weren't great photographers, but what they were great was, what, what they were great at was developing a concept, like a, a conceptual art piece. But when I would see the photography, I would go, this just isn't very good. And that's on me, that's my fault. I, that is completely inaccurate. Yes, there's work being done in the art space that's not good, but there's the conceptual work to me now is far more relevant and far more interesting than any other genre in photography. I find that art photography, the actual industry of art photography is the last remaining open genre left. Everything else has been so decimated and dumbed down through metrics and social media. Art photography, legitimately you can do anything you want 
If you have a good concept, you know your history, you know your context, you're a good business person, you make good work, you can do anything. And I look at the people who are doing work like this and they to me are the ones that I would watch and look at and say, what can I learn from these people? You know, the Terrence Simons, the Edward Bertinskys, the, the, the um, you know, Elena Dorfman is a friend of mine. She's a high-end fine, fine art photographer. Uh, you have um, uh, Andres Gursky, which I just mentioned before. You've got um, uh, Gregory Crudson. These are people who are operating in, that, in those spaces. And there's a lot more, a lot more. But those are sort of some of the, the, the bigger names. That's what it is. For somebody to go on YouTube and just apply that label to whatever kind of work, that'd be like me going on YouTube and saying, I'm a fine art documentary photographer. I'm not really, you know, it's just not, I can take the label, it just doesn't mean anything. So, but that art world, it's a tricky little game, my friends. That's not exactly a space that me as personally would want to play with. Those are not kids on the playground that I want to hang out with. I want to hang out with the the rougher kids on the edge of the playground, the ones with the dirt bikes. Like in Bad News Bears, it's the, the, kid, uh, the kid on the motorcycle. That's who I want to hang out with. I don't want to hang out with the art crowd. This is not my scene, not my thing. Just can't do it. That's what I think an art, fine art photographer is. Number eight, and this is a really good one. Are business cards still viable? So I have a business card for Blurb. It is beautifully printed letterpress business card that I cannot remember the last time I handed one out because people are lazy. They don't want to carry a card around. They just want to plug it into their phone. They want to swipe. Now you can't even plug in. You just want to swipe your phone. Soon it's just you're going to pass people. And it's just going to be downloaded into your skull. Uh, but as a photographer, which I'm not anymore, let me repeat that. I'm not a photographer anymore. This is my business card. Can you even see it? This is a Mad Cloud Digest, five and a quarter by eight and a quarter. It is beautiful printing. And this basically is my business card. Now, I rarely, is the only color in there, I think. Uh, the, I rarely, rarely, rarely hand these out anymore because I don't really need to. I'm not looking for photography work. But what this was, was if someone was interested in working with me, and I wanted to work with them. That to me was the introduction. That was the handshake, the printed handshake of, I am not a looky-loo, I'm not a tourist, I'm not an Instagrammer. I can, th I can complete my sentences. I, have, I can think in full circle. I know how to encapsulate a project. I know how to edit sequence. I can use typography and I can write. And I do three or four things. I write, I shoot portraiture, I shoot documentary work, I do interviews, and all that is readily apparent with one quick flip through this. That is very, very different than saying, go to my Instagram handle. Good grief. And I'm gonna do a whole, I'm gonna do a Dear Photographer 2 film. The people I wanna work with if I said to them, go to my Instagram handle, they would never talk to me again. They would just not really consider me somebody they would want to work with because they're not, on they're not on Instagram. You cannot expect a CEO to go to Instagram to look at your work. They're not going to do it. They're not on there. So the business card in book form, I think is a great idea. And I actually think just a regular business card in paper form is fine too because they're so inexpensive to do now. And if someone is appreciative of that and you have it, great. And for, for my blurb job, don't need it because people have just moved on. And plus now there's so much digital communication through my blurb job that it's rare that anybody reaches out and we're not doing in-person events. So that's it. Okay, that's the Q&A for this session. If I didn't get to your question, I'll be, I'll be back sometime in the near future. And a, thank you so much for sending the questions in. And remember, I'm one guy with one opinion, nothing more. Take it for what it is and I will be back.